Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for attending this Young Achievers Symposium organized by the Center for Socially Responsible AI at Penn State University. Um, today, we are delighted to have Uma Bahat as our guest speaker. Uma is a PhD candidate in the machine learning group at the University of Cambridge. His expertise lies in human-machine collaboration and interest-worthy machine learning spanning the fairness, robustness, and explainability of AI system. He studies how to create systems that uh, explain their prediction to stakeholders, leverage stakeholders' expertise for better human-machine team performance, and interact with stakeholders to account for their goals and values. Currently, Uma is an enriched an enrichment student at the Alan Turing Institution and a student fellow at the Lever Home Center for the Future of Intelligence. Before that, he was a fellow at, at the Moselle uh, Foundation and a research fellow at the Partnership on AI. He holds a, a bachelor and master degree in electronic and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. So without further ado, let's welcome Uma with his talk. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so, so as is mentioned, my name is Umang. Um, the title of my talk today is gonna be um, Challenges and Frontiers in, in Deploying Transparent Machine Learning more broadly responsible AI. Um, so we'll go through a bunch of research we've done in this area pertaining to explainability and then specifically pertaining to explainability and uncertainty, uh, two different forms of transparency that have been the focus of my research. Um, there'll be natural stopping points for, for questions. And if you have any questions after the fact, um, feel free to reach out via email or um, DM me on Twitter. Um, both are equally convenient. <clears throat> Wonderful. So I'm going to split today's talk into, into two. Um, I'm going to, the first part will be focused on the challenges associated with explainability. And we'll start by defining terms and then taking it from there. The second part will be focused on uncertainty as a form of transparency. So moving beyond our obsession with explainable AI and uh, uh, explanation kind of becoming synonymous with transparency these days. So we'll start with our first part. What are the challenges associated with explainability? So the starting point of my of a lot of our research uh, kind of began by asking this question: How are existing approaches to explainability used in practice? So explainably, I DARPA's grant was I don't know must have been in the late '90s when they proposed it or early 2000s, and there have been lots of different papers and work, uh, lots of work that's been done around explainable AI, in so far as you think about the rule list community and just. GoFi community has been thinking a lot about transparency and various forms of explanation, as well as just modern deep learning methods and trying to make them more transparent and explainable. So our starting point was really trying to assess, well, what is actually used in practice? Like what are, is being deployed by organizations? So the, this we, we kind of summarized our findings in this paper called Explainable Machine Learning and Deployment. It was work that appeared at the uh, ACM Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in 2020. And it was work we did with, alongside the Partnership on AI, a global nonprofit that brings together um, academics, uh, governments, uh, industry organizations, and civil societies. And what we did is um, we decided to, we, we had like this observation that there's so many algorithms that have been proposed to explain machine learning model output. So specifically, we could study within the partnership on AI's body, a membership body of, fifth, of over 100 organizations, not only civil societies, but also all of your major tech companies. How were these algorithms actually used in practice? And the first thing we realized that when you set out to do something rather ambitious like this to ensure and kind of understand how explainability is used at your major tech companies, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, um, Amazon, and also at civil societies and their opinions on it, think Human Rights Watch, UNDP, Amnesty International, Access Now. Um, the most important thing was actually establishing some sort of shared language. So for all intents and purposes of this talk, as well as for most of my research, I define transparency as providing stakeholders with relevant information about how a model works. There are lots of pieces of re relevant information that you could probably provide. One might be providing you with code, 
it's a form of transparency. I mean, only developers can really understand it, but it's it's transparent because in that sense, it's reproducible providing you with documentation on how the system has been trained, providing you with the certification that a trusted third party auditor has come in and validated the system. These are all relevant pieces of information about how a model works or in some sense, it's, it's providing you with transparency into model behavior. Specifically, one form of transparency that, that I've been most interested in is explainability. And for all intents and purposes of this talk and my research, I define that as providing insight into model behavior for specific data point or data points. So how can you tell me how this model is going to behave on a particular point? There are lots of different ways of going about doing that. When you're doing inference, I might be able to tell you, well, here's the features that you use, here are the training points that are important, and, and we'll get into the, the classic forms of explanation that were used. But it's important to kind of draw this distinction that there are lots of really important forms of transparency that exist that might be part of the socio-technical ecosystem where a model lives, but for now, we're going to restrict ourselves to explanation. So trying to provide insight into how a model behaves. So in our study, we found that there are lots of different types of explanations that are, that are popular um, and that are used. But by and large, they can be summarized into three categories. Uh, the first type of explanation that was really popular was feature importance. How do I tell you which feature was most important when doing predictions? So you provide me with a set of covariates, and I tell you which of those covariates was most important for doing prediction. I tell you my age, my body temperature, and my weight, and I ask, do I have a do I have a fever? We hope that you use the body temperature when making such a decision, and you're not using the other two features. Now, were you to find that age was actually the most important, there ought to be some form of recourse, which doesn't exist now, um, but ought to be some sort of recourse for a non-technical stakeholder to kind of make that change. But feature importance is rather intuitive. It's how we intuit most of the time. Lots of really popular techniques like um, Lime or Shap, which you might've heard of and we'll be discussing later on, kind of fall into this category. Another form of explanation that was really popular amongst all these organizations was this idea of sample importance. Sample importance is, this, is, is the notion that in the training data itself, there might be data points that you've observed in the past that are influential when doing inference right now. Okay, so if I have a medical diagnostic system, there might be a patient I saw seven years ago whose diagnosis is actually important and influences my decision today. Okay, and then there's this idea of a counterfactual explanation, which really interestingly has analogous definitions in um, credit law. Um, but most interestingly for us as, as computer scientists and people who are interested in AI, technically um, a counterfactual explanation simply argues, how do you change a particular input in order to change the output? So today you denied me a loan, given my current state. Tomorrow, in order to grant me a loan, what do you need to change? Do, you need to, do I need to be older? Do I need to make more money? Do I need to move? Right, there might be some immutables in this that you might provide, but by and large, I'm providing you with a form of recourse that says, here is the form of recourse that you can take in order to change your outcome. So feature importance, sample importance, and counterfactual explanations by and large became the most popular forms of explanation in our, uh, in our study. Now, in thinking about the stakeholders of these systems of explanations, there were four resounding groups that, uh, that, that came up in our study. So the first is that there are executives who absolutely adore the rhetoric associated with explainability. Providing a transparent system sounds really great if you can get up on stage and say, look, we have a explainable systems that will tell you when they're going to fail. That's wonderful. I don't think any of us would deny that that's a bad thing. But the rhetoric associated with explainability made it really hard for data science teams to actually operationalize on these systems, right? I'd rather just claim that I have explanations instead of actually providing them and them being of value to any of my other stakeholders. So executives were a large stakeholder group in, in different explainability tools that were in deployment uh, at, at, at a lot of organizations. The second was engineers. Engineers have a vested interest in understanding how their models work. They might may or may not have domain expertise to actually validate um, if their model is behaving in a sensible way, um, but they know that they can expose this to the right person and kind of understand if they're going in the right direction. 
uh, end users are uh, another stakeholder group. One of the things that I have uh, come to abhor is that you have every single machine learning paper on explainability for a very long time was opening up with end users deserve transparency and deserve explanations, uh, or they have some GDPR site and they say that uh, regulators are saying that we need to provide, you have a right to an explanation. So therefore we're now going to study some really specific form of explanation that is going to be validated on MTurk workers or maybe even just on graduate students. <laughs> um, and there's really no discussion of end users at all. So one of the things that, 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 that we basically noticed is that almost no one at any of these organizations are actually using any of these explainable AI algorithms to provide any form of transparency to end users, even though in some sense we're using and we're motivating the use of some of these tools by saying we can provide end users with transparency and explainability into how their models behave given that they're interacting with models. One of our collaborator groups at MPI um, um, in, in a lab headed by Krishna Gumadi had basically bought a bunch of Facebook advertisements for a very specific type of person. They said, oh, well, I wanna target 45 year olds who have visited a specific ice cream parlor with a specific advertisement. And they live in this specific postal code. And if you were to use the, why am I seeing this button? Um, which is a feature actually made by Krishna Gade, who's now running Fiddler. Um, what they do is they, if you look at those explanations that are provided, the explanation might actually be, you're seeing this advertisement because you're be between 18 and 45 and you live in the United States of America. There's no kind of regulatory uh, compliance in place that basically says, oh, you need something faithful. So either it implies that we, don't have any regulation in place, which is our fourth and final stakeholder, or we're actually not even using algorithms in order to serve you a bat. <laughs> and one of those ought to be true, and obviously getting to the bottom of that is, is important, but in some sense, it's, it's important to have like regulators kind of in these conversations around explainability and transparency, especially if we want um, some semblance of accountability, which might actually be the reason we wanted transparency in the first place. Okay, so given that we had this, I'm going to kind of breeze through three of the findings and then uh, and then kind of keep trudging along. But three of the three three major findings of our work were basically explainability is primarily just used for debugging. It's used for debugging by and by machine learning engineers. So uh, a lot of engineers love to look at like saliency maps of their test set, and they think that that will provide them with some semblance of security uh, that their system behaves in a sensible way. But in actuality, it's unclear how they use errors that are detected in this way to actually improve their models. But primarily explainability in its current form is used as a debugging tool. Unfortunately, the goals of explainability within a lot of organizations are not clearly defined. And this makes it really hard to understand how transparency ought to be kind of, how it should manifest basically throughout the organization. And the third is that there might be technical limitations that make it actually very difficult to deploy explanations in real time. Calculating the sample, sample importance usually requires influence functions, which requires inverting a Hessian, which is a decubed operation. You can't do that in real time. <laughs> uh, you can try to approximate it, but in actuality, a lot of companies have, have kind of hit a roadblock when you're actually trying to deploy something that's actually faithful to the model. So um, th this is kind of where we, got to with the partnership on AI. And what we were able to do then is host a convening, uh, which is summarized in this work, Machine Learning Explainability for External Stakeholders, uh, which appeared at an ICMO workshop. But what we did is we actually had brought in like 33 participants from five countries, 15 were ML experts, three were designers, six legal experts, nine policymakers, and they had vast varying domain expertise. And, and our goal was to kind of facilitate an interstakeholder conversation around explainable machine learning. So this is the last in-person event I did before the pandemic hit in Feb 2020, uh, co-located with uh, AAAI and AIES in New York. Um, and uh, it actually was an, an incredible event and I implore who, those that are interested, um, I encourage anybody who's interested to kind of read it. Um, and one of the interesting things that we found is that there are two ways in which we can get involvement from external stakeholders. So not uh, machine learning engineers, anybody else effectively, um, getting them kind of involved in the explainability process. So uh, what 
what I want to kind of show you throughout the rest of this first part of the talk is that can we ask what we call practitioner-driven research questions? So as a result of that convening, we actually came up with three really concrete research questions that we could ask. Um, and given these three concrete research questions, we were able to bring those answers back to those external stakeholders. So the first question that we, that we were asked is, uh, can you actually provide practitioners with a methodology for evaluating explanations? Uh, the second was actually brought up by a regulator. Can existing explainability tools be used to identify model unfairness? And the third is that, can you quantify how much uncertainty is associated with given explanations? So for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, ignore the, uh, I'm going to breeze through the first one very quickly. We'll spend some time on the second one. And the third one, I will just point you to the resource where we actually tackle this. Um, and then we'll move on to the second part. So starting with this first question, how do you actually provide practitioners with a way of evaluating explanations? So this paper appeared at Ijkai in 20. 2020, um, but it was kind of motivated by a lot of the work that was done uh, by uh, in the, with the partnership on AI. So uh, specifically, we think about how do you evaluate a feature-based model explanation, so one that is effectively feature importance. So there are lots of really common ways of actually obtaining feature importance. So one that was really popular uh, from Marco and, and Carlos and Samir was, was this idea of can you take a really long, really non-convex model and approximate it locally with a linear model and then take the coefficients of that linear model as the explanation, okay? That's, that's effectively what they do. They take local surrogate models and approximate in some neighborhood. And they're like, okay, the coefficients of that linear model are exactly what I'm gonna use as my explanation. So age will be important if and only if the tangent line I fit close to the decision boundary is high. Um, another form of explanation uh, from Soon Lee's lab in 2017 is called Shapley values, which basically tries to consider all possible combinations of features um, and, and allocates some amount of, uh, of value provided, basically. How much does my predicted probability change were I to mask out that feature? Okay. And that comes with nice game theoretic properties. But other than that, there's very little motivation for how this would work. Um, so these are the two really popular forms of explanations. And the third, which, which actually is used quite a lot as well, is, is called integrated gradients, um, which is actually some variant of SHAP. But the point I want to make is that there are lots of different methods that are out there. These are three popular ones. There are tons that are there. There are lots of repositories where you can play around with these different types of explanations. And it's actually quite overwhelming for data scientists. And this was something that became very apparent when we were talking with the, the data scientists at the partnership on AI. So what we decided to do is kind of collate a list of, well, how do you actually even evaluate these explanations? So the first sensible evaluation criteria that we consider, um, which, which already existed in the literature, is that do similar inputs have similar explanations, right? And you can, you write this out more formally, basically saying, look, like, if I were to look in a R-sized ball around an input, how much would the explanation vary, okay? And then how much does it maximally vary in that same ball? Pretty straightforward. Second of all, another form of uh, another um, evaluation criteria that's sensible is well, are the features that I'm providing high value to, that I'm assigning, giving high attribution to, are they actually the ones that are important? So, one way of measuring this is saying, well, if I were to mask out those features, how much does my predicted probability drop? And in some sense, the attribution that I provide to a feature ought to correlate with how much my model's performance decreases when I remove it, okay? And then you consider this over all possible subsets. So this is a more formal way of writing that same thing out. You fix the subset size and you're gonna say for all subset features, subsets of size four, I'm gonna consider random sets of features and consider how much does the sum of the attribution I provide those features correlate with the drop or the change in predicted probability upon dropping those features, okay? Both of these measures had kind of existed in various forms throughout the literature. Another form of uh, evaluation criteria that we created or that we, that we consider is this idea of complexity, right? How can you understand if an explanation is digestible? Well, people usually say in the Cogsign literature that at any given time, a human can only consume four or five pieces of information. But if I have 15 million features that I pass in in my input data, I can't really just pick four or five. 
uh, to, to provide to you. Um, but I might actually want that. That might actually be desirable to go down to just four or five. So how can I measure how complex the explanation and provided is in terms of the input features, right? So we consider doing this by basically taking an explanation function um, and, and creating a probability distribution and taking the entropy of it. The details are in the paper, but in some sense, what, what matters is the ethos of this. I want to see how simple the explanation is. So the simplest explanation would be one where all of the attribution is done by one feature. The most complex one is a uniform distribution over all possible features, right? Now, the interesting thing is once you have these evaluation criteria formalized and you have all of these different methods, we actually consider aggregating explanations from various explanation types with respect to an evaluation criteria. So Lime might not be the most faithful, but Lime and Shop together, some, some combination of them, and we'll talk about the ways in which you can do those combinations, like some combination of them actually might be sensible, right? And it might be di more digestible or it might be more faithful, right? And that's, the, that, that's basically uh, what, we, what we observe. So one thing that we do is we then say, okay, well, one candidate way of combining these is taking like convex combination of explanation functions or doing some sort of centroid based or mean, median, or even rank based aggregation, uh, or we're doing even something fancy like Bayesopt. But the basic premise is that I now have a metric that I can specify or a combination of metrics I can specify. And I can now take all these different explanation functions as a practitioner and say, okay, well, you know what? Like my Lime, Shap, and integrated gradients explanations all differ. They're all highlighting different pixels. Now, one of them might be right. One of them might be wrong. None of them might be right. But because I know the type of the property of the, the property I want my explanation to satisfy, I can consider a kind of optimizing directly for that, which you might not do necessarily. Right? So um, basic, that's the basic premise of what we do once we have these valuation criteria. Now, um, I, I, if you're if you're interested, there there are definitely lots of details that I've glossed over, but I but I just want to say that one of the things that we show is that it can actually be useful to do this type of aggregation of local explanations. We show that aggregating these local Shapley value explanations, if you assume a bunch of Shapley value explanations, will actually result in a Shapley value explanation, which is quite nice, uh, a nice little result. Um, and then we actually show that you can actually learn aggregate explanations to lower sensitivity and complexity using that that objective that we showed. And we have a few algorithms that we propose to say, well, if you want to lower complexity, here's what you would consider doing, given a set of arbitrary explanations, right? Um, and I think in the end, the, 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 the great thing is we can go back to these practitioners and kind of validate and create like a feedback loop for us to consider uh, if these evaluation criteria are actually useful in practice, because it's not clear that they actually might be. Right. These are things that exist in the machine learning community, but in some sense, we were able to kind of tackle this problem head on and start an iterative conversation with um, those who are actually considering using these tools. Now, <clears throat> another, the second question that we considered asking as a result of that workshop, but also just in, in general, uh, after discussion with practitioners is, can any of these existing explainability tools, particularly feature importance, can it actually be used to identify model unfairness, right? So this was based on a paper that appeared at the European Conference on AI in 2020. Um, and one of the things that I, I wanna do is just like motivate why this problem is even interesting. So on the left-hand side, we have three features. Let's say the time spent doing some tasks, the amount of money you make in your age. So in the US, based on the Fair Housing Act of 1956, using age, this is a bad thing, it's discriminatory, right? Model B on the other hand, doesn't use age, okay? So seemingly just from this perspective, a model that uses age is going to be unfair and a model that doesn't use uh, age is going to be fair. Now, when we were talking to regulators in the UK and US, um, we, we noticed that someone actually mentioned, this wasn't even our idea, someone mentioned, well, why don't I just use this idea of feature importance to see if the sensitive attribute is actually important? Are the gradients of the sensitive attribute high or just in general, like, does it appear in my feature importance explanation? So what we set out to do is uh, basically warn everybody that this is a nonsensical thing to do. Specifically by showing what we're going to do is we're going to show that I can take a model A and convert it into a model B. <laughs> I'm going to take the, uh, the a model that relies on age and I'm going to turn it into a model that looks like it doesn't rely on age. And hopefully the predictions will also all be the same. So there's been a lot of work on manipulating explanations. 
there's a huge line of work that basically says I can manipulate inputs by say, basically doing adversarial perturbations on an input and then modifying the downstream explanation, which may or may not be gradient based, but that's most of these are all gradient based attacks. Okay, so I'm going to attack the input and then I'm going to say, oh, look at the explanation. Now I can change it from the outline of a dog to the outline of, uh, of, of a car. And in doing that, I've made an adversarial attack that gives a misleading explanation. Okay. That's kind of what all of these works have done. More interestingly for us, there have been, there's been some work actually some, by, by someone else in our group, uh, Juyan Hyo, uh, basically saying that you can actually perform an adversarial attack on the parameters of the model and then get control of the explanations. So let's first talk about what an adversarial attack on the parameters is. An adversarial attack on the parameters is basically saying, well, I have a parametric form. I'm going to now perturb that such that the outcomes of the model, or in this case, the explanation, so some function of the outcomes, takes a particular form. So that's actually kind of cool. We, I mean, you're, you're basically going to just attack your, your parameters and hope that, uh, and, and, and show that I can actually get my model to dance in any way I want it to. Okay, so our goal will be let's downgrade the explanation, specifically the attribution provided on that sensitive attribute via an adversarial perturbation of the parameters and thus hiding the unfairness that exists. So uh, simply our setup is let's have J, like our explanation function be G, right? Some random explanation function, Shap, Lime, and the Jth feature is the sensitive attribute. That's the one we want to downgrade. We have some classifier F. And our goal is to say that F is parametrized by theta and I'm going to find some parametric uh, transformation delta such that two things are true. One, the model's outcomes are similar. And two, that the attribution on the jth feature is lower for the perturbed model. Exactly what we want. And very sensibly, the way we go about doing this is taking uh, the original cross entropy loss or whatever loss you have, and then adding this P norm over the gradient at that J feature. Okay? And then we call this the adversarial explanation attack. Okay? Now, I'm going to just talk through the result for a second, which is that on the, on the left-hand side, you'll see the ranking of the sensitive attribute with respect to a bunch of different explanation functions. Okay? So you can see for the second one, gradient times input, it's usually in the third position for every single input. It's always important, this sensitive attribute, or even for integrated gradients, always has high magnitude, okay? But after our attack, we can actually take the input or take the um, ranking, uh, magnitude ranking of the sensitive attribute and, and decrease it as desired. Now, interestingly, this is done, this significantly de decreases like the relative importance, again, because I'm saying this is the magnitude of the ranking, right, of, of this sensitive attribute. This generalizes across test points. And most interestingly, it actually transfers across almost all explanation methods. But the only thing we're regularizing for is the thing all the way on top, where it's already already really, it's already really low, <laughs> right? Um, and, and there's actually a bunch of very cool work that's followed on from this, which has actually tried to prove why this, should, why this would be the case, right? You're basically finding another minima nearby where the gradients with respect to the sensitive attribute are low. And they call this fair washing um, for those that are interested. So there's a bunch of really great work um, uh, in this direction by a bunch, actually by uh, Klaus Mueller's lab in Germany. <clears throat> but we basically were able to take this work and go right back to that, pra that, that practitioner and be like, look, red flag, do not consider, insert name of regulatory body, trying to use transparency methods or explanation methods to validate unfairness in its current form, right? So being part of that conversation, these interstakeholder conversations basically allows you to get your research into the hands of people that were, who are actually making decisions. And I find that to be really important, okay? Um, and the third, I guess, thing that I want to mention, so the third practitioner research question we ask is, is how much uncertainty is associated with these explanations? Some of these explanations might, uh, it's unclear if this explanation that, that you have uh, is, is actually the right explanation or the only explanation uh, for the model you're uh, looking at. Uh, so we, we tackled this in, in our work with Quantum Black. <clears throat> and I'm just going to jump directly to the results. Uh, I can talk to you about how we actually do it. Um, but what we can show is that 
if I consider an ensembling based approach where I get a bunch of models that all have a very similar performance, and then I look at all of their Shapley value explanations for a single point, what we find is, the, or we find two very interesting things. The first is that if the predictions in that ensemble for a particular point vary a lot, so there's a lot of uncertainty, then the explanations will vary a lot as well. But if the predictions don't vary, then the prediction is certain and the explanations won't vary at well. So predictive and uncertainty will actually manifest as variance in the explanation. Now, why is this a problem? Because I can actually now go look through that ensemble and I can pick out any model because all of them are the same prediction. I can pick out any model that lives here. I want low capital, low reliance on capital gain. Sure. I want high reliance on uh, hours per week. Great. I can give you whatever you want. Whatever explanation you want, I can provide you. And that is not good. <laughs> that is, this basically means that there are lots of really good models with similar, ex, with differing explanations, especially when you're looking basically on OOD data. So data that uh, is highly uncertain. <clears throat> the other finding that we have is that uncertainty will degrade the quality of explanation. So with respect to a lot of the metrics we talked about, if you look at OOD, uh, predict, o -O OOD data, your, your metrics tend to perform quite poorly. So in some sense, this is like a saving grace. But again, at test time, this won't save you. Uh, but it will test, it, it will kind of help you uh, kind of reason about this a little bit better, which is that on OOD data, like we observe a degradation in explanation uh, evaluation criteria, just like you would expect on other evaluation criteria you have. So what is the implication? The first is that data science practitioners kind of need to consider the entire distribution of functions, right? Not just the point estimate, not just the ERM. There are a bunch of different really good models that all actually have differing explanations, which actually requires some domain expertise to think through. And the second implication will lead to some work that we'll talk about in the second half is that feature importance actually performs really poorly on uncertain data. It's really unreliable. So one thing we'll talk about in a second is this idea of counterfactual latent uncertainty explanations, which is a mouthful, but it basically says when you have an uncertain prediction, here's what you should do instead. And we provide you with a different form of explanation that feels like feature importance, that's just as usable as feature importance, but actually has a, a clear and more important definition and, and meaning. So um, practitioner-driven research questions are something that I hope everybody here can take away. These are a different way of thinking about doing research such that the questions you ask will actually have an impact on the real world and are actually motivated by real world use cases, especially thinking that in the kind of setting we are in right now where we're trying to think about responsible AI and getting it into the right hands um, and ensuring that we have lots of um, interdisciplinary stakeholders who, who are listening to the AI community and who we are listening to as we're building our tools. Um, so this kind of brings me to the end of the first half of the talk. Uh, I'll pause quickly for questions. And if there aren't any, I will continue the second half. Okay, so um, so I have a question so about the unfairness part. So I think there is a work from Bing Teams group. So basically, you know, it's a Europe's paper, I think 2019 or 2018. Mm -hmm. So basically th what they are doing is that they're uh, testing different, you know, integrate, uh, you know, you know, the different feature-based, you know, explanations. So basically what they're doing is that to randomize the last layer of the neural network, but they see that, you know, the explanation is still the same, still makes sense, even though the prediction is not making sense. I feel like it's a very, capture a very similar um, property as your work. Right. 100%, 100%, 100%. I mean, I think that, the, so I think you might be referring to like the work that Julia, like I think it was Bean and Julius. Um, and and mm -hmm. the, the basic idea, um, you're, you're spot on, is we can not only randomize last layer, but I think they even do randomized training with randomized labels. They randomize basically various portions of the, the ML pipeline and show that these explanations actually don't change or holding a lot of constant and changing parts of the training procedure will just randomize the explanation to keep the predictions the same. So I, I, I think that you, you're alluding to a lot of my issues with the explanation literature. And that's really why this talk, when I originally used to give it, was only the first half. And I was just very frustrated. Now it has a second half because we have particular directions that we could use. So we're not frustrated anymore. And it's I, the, my, my biggest issue is that 
it's unclear if this is even a form of explanation people even want to consume. Even if we were to solve this problem, and it's definitely alarming that if I can randomize the labels, my explanations don't change. But I think this is actually an issue with the fact that we want those explanations in the first place, because it's unclear that people actually want them. No one's going to come to you and say this, you know, this saliency map, oh my gosh, it looks great, or it doesn't look great. It, this is, I need to assuage my issues with this x-ray, give me a saliency map. Like, I, no one speaks like that. Right. And, and unless, unless this is a form that's requested by someone who actually wants it, then I don't know if that's the direction we're going to go in. And I think Bean kind of got a flavor of that when she started working on the concept based explanations work um, and, and kind of started thinking in, in different forms of explanation. But unfortunately, those are very annotation hungry uh, methods. So <laughs> I don't think we have data sets and I don't think we'll be, we're at a point where on the fly, people will be able to get data sets that have annotations of large numbers of concepts that appear in them. Like, yet, I think we might be able to. Um, I hope the people at Scale AI are able to solve this for us uh, so we can start training fun models. Um, but but yeah, that would be my uh, reaction to that point. But, but awesome question. Okay. Yeah. So with that, I'll, I think I'll just jump to the second part and then we can talk about questions at the end if anybody has any. <clears throat> So the second half of this talk is called uncertainty as a form of transparency. So um, I, I think that people always say that AI is going to take over the world, but we still get these like, egregious errors from these neural nets, right? Where it's like, that is clearly not a dog. It is clearly a cat. If you beg to differ, we can have a chat later. But again, these systems have a lot of uncertainty inherently associated with them, and we just don't communicate it to people. Mostly maybe because we're afraid that people are actually not going to be able to do anything with the information. <laughs> um, but there are really sensible ways where you can actually think about providing uncertainty to people. So uh, with the partnership on AI, we actually decided to, to say, well, I think we need more people thinking about this idea of uncertainty as a form of transparency. Just as explainability has been a form of transparency for the community for a while, can we actually view all of the uncertainty literature, the, the Bayesian literature, the frequentist work in this space, conformal methods, kind of bring it all together and say, well, this is a form of transparency in and of itself. So instead of providing an explanation, or in addition to providing an explanation, I can now communicate this uncertainty information to you in a useful manner, right? So you need to measure it, communicate it, and then, then kind of use it in the right way. So I guess broadly, like what we've been talking about is, is actually algorithmic transparency. I didn't make this distinction in the beginning, um, but specifically when we were talking about transparency at the beginning, we said it's any relevant piece of information about the model. Algorithmic transparency is actually the relevant information that the model can provide, <laughs> right? So an explanation is actually something that the model can tell you, right? Because I'm going to query it with an explanation function. Uncertainty information is something that the model can tell you. Documentation is something that a human has to write. Certification is something a human has to do. They are what, what I would call procedural transparency, right? The forms of transparency that require, that, that kind of comment on the socio-technical ecosystem where the model lives. So um, again, we, we start from this premise where explainability is this popular form of transparency, but we want to move beyond it. And a lot of people have worked on this question and can we kind of aggregate this work into a salient piece? So in terms of measuring uncertainty, there are lots of different ways that we quantify uncertainty. So if you have a softmax distribution, softmax probability distribution at the end, I might just take the entropy of that to say, here's how much uncertainty is associated with my outcome. Uh, or we might look at the variance in a uh, regression right, when we're doing regression, right? The variance uh, that, that you have over your, your current estimate, you might even consider like mean and error bars that you're providing to people as forms of quantifying uncertainty. Now, one of the things that I that I found very interesting is, is kind of going through this is that there are very there are various forms of actually getting uncertainty. Um, so if you were considering an ensemble of, of predictions, you actually can notice that there is a lot of uncertainty associated with um, in, in basically what we'd call like the gap regions, the regions that are in between the data that the data manifold that I've observed, right? Um, we might call this epistemic uncertainty, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and you might also have noise that is inherent to your data set that you've collected, which we would call aleatoric uncertainty, so noise uncertainty. And together, they form what's called predictive uncertainty, which is located in that third pane on the right wall. Um, and uh, I think that we'll dive a little deep now into the ideas of what are the different sources of uncertainty. So on the left-hand side, on the bottom left, we have this 
simple moons data set, which many of you may have seen. Um, it has two overlap, two classes that are overlapping. And, and let's say we tried to do Bayesian linear regression on this. So try to fit a line in the Bayesian sense to this data set. So now in the middle, in the orange, we actually see that this is what we're going to call noise uncertainty, aleatoric uncertainty. This is noise that is inherent in the data set that is causing clause overlap, which can basically not be amended by collecting more data, <laughs> right? Collecting more data will be utterly useless to reduce noise uncertainty. One thing that might be is perhaps adding an additional feature, right? Because we're using a linear separate hyperplane, uh, separating plane, we might just add another feature that basically puts blue on top and orange in the bottom, and then we'll be able to linearly split the data very trivially. But adding additional data will just increase class overlap. It won't do anything else. On the other hand, um, epistemic uncertainty or model uncertainty is what's located on the right pane all the way on the bottom. Now, epistemic uncertainty can be cured, right? It basically asks the question that have we even observed enough data to make make confident predictions. So as we move further away, the epistemic uncertainty increases, but it can quickly be decreased by just collecting more data from those regions where I don't know how the model should behave, right? And this is a, this is a very interesting distinction that I, I hope you take away, is that when you might, it, it's important to understand the source of uncertainty, because if it is one form or the other, there, the recourse strategy you have to reduce the uncertainty in your model will, will be different. The question is like, how do you even use uncertainty in practice, right? Um, so let's consider fairness for a second. And specifically, let's consider the difference between measurement bias and, and sampling bias. Uh, in many cases, you might not have access to a predicted attribute, or you might have a noisy predicted attribute, right? A predicted attribute, like you might not have a good estimate of how old someone is. You might not have a good estimate of where they live because you have a very hard time understanding like their geolocation. And these, this form of measurement bias is actually aleatoric uncertainty. It's inherently just noise uncertainty. And there's actually interesting work that appeared at AIES last year, which said that aleatoric errors are going to be a lot harder to fix than epistemic errors, right? For fairness, right? And epistemic errors are actually usually caused by sampling bias, which is effectively the exact same thing that we just discussed. If I've not sampled in the regions in the corners, therefore I have, uh, I'm going to have high uncertainty in that region. Now, the pro point is that sampling bias will manifest as unfairness. And measurement bias will also manifest as unfairness. So understanding the source of your unfairness is equivalent to understanding the source of your uncertainty, which is really cool. Another form of uh, using uncertainty might be uh, you, when you're actually making doing decision making. So if I knew the expertise of an individual, I might build like something like a reject option classifier, which will choose to abstain from prediction if I am not confident in my prediction. So a reject option classifier might say, uh, something like the following, if I have a uniform distribution or something close to it over all possible classes, like I'm going to refrain from prediction because of whatever I'm going to say is probably going to be useless and wrong because <laughs> I really don't know what I'm saying, right? There are really interesting things here around considering if you knew a priori the expertise of the decision maker, then you can actually fine tune the model such that it rejects when the expert is good. And you can use those other parameters to do better class separation uh, or do better feature extraction um, earlier on, which is, which is quite nice and fun. Um, and then the third form of, of like using uncertainty is actually a, a more socio-technical one, something that coming from the judgment decision-making literature, which is that providing uncertainty shows the ability of the system because we hope that if you're confident then you're also accurate, right? If we have a well-calibrated system, shows benevolence of the developer, right? Because the developer is actually showing where the weaknesses of the system lie. And it shows the integrity of the system itself because when you're, you're okay with admitting that you're wrong, right? And we have this interesting argument that we worked with someone on uh, uh, to kind of think about uncertainty through this lens. In terms of communicating uncertainty, there are lots of different ways that people choose to communicate it. Um, uh, one of the things that blew my mind when I started talking about this and like reading this literature is that um, these hurricane plots that I remember seeing as a kid are actually uncertainty plots. So the hurricane does not get bigger, which blew my mind and when I was like 10 years old. The hurricane will choose one path through this conic function and then that will be the path of the hurricane, right? 
So the eye of the hurricane will move, doesn't get bigger, but we've been shown this since we were children. We've said since so many of us must have seen this, right? This is a uncertainty visualization. We're implicitly being communicated the uncertainty associated with the forecasting models that our meteorologists have. There are other ways of communicating it. You might have estimates of like the number of crimes that someone's going to commit, and then you'll have these fan flan plots. You'll have distributions that you'll show, error plots, violent plots, and so on and so forth. But these are ways of communicating uncertainty. Now, the thing is, a lot of data-driven decision-making actually just captures like really complicated nonlinear functions. And the good thing is this helps us scale the big data sets and scale the complex systems, right? But... One of the things is that like you might actually have uncertainty in this system that you need to communicate and explain, right? Earlier on, like I, I hadn't mentioned this figure, but if you're doing like segmentation, which something like Wave, which is a self-driving car and startup in the UK is doing, you might be able to parse apart the various forms of uncertainty. Is the uncertainty that my LiDAR sensors are facing or my cameras are facing, are they because I've never seen something like this before? Or is there some sort of occlusion that's causing me to have this sort of uncertainty, which is effectively causing class overlap? Right? Or is it something I've never seen, which I can then just collect and then retrain on and, and I'll be fine. Right? So the understanding these sources of uncertainty can actually be really helpful. But unfortunately, when it, it becomes more and more important as we move into the regime of more and more complex models. So um, one of the things that, that it's important to think about is if my system doesn't know the answer, right? I take an input, let's say X, I pass it through some probabilistic model. If it's a certain prediction, I might accept it and get an explanation in the way I just described earlier in the first half of the talk, Lime, Shap, integrated gradients, whatever it might be. But what do you do if the, set, the, predict, the prediction has been rejected and now I have an uncertain prediction? Do we just leave the practitioners out to dry or is there something better we can do? So we actually tackled this question um, in, in, a, in a paper that appeared at iClear as an oral in, in 2021 called Getting a Clue. Um, and what we actually did is uh, we'll, we'll start with like the very simple setup. I basically want to be able to highlight the evidence associated for each class. And sometimes you'll have conflicting evidence, which is the noise that we discussed, or you'll have lack of evidence. So it'll be just far away from the original decision boundary, which is epistemic uncertainty. Right. Now, we can actually pose this problem using some variant of counterfactuals. So let's first think about why counterfactuals are relevant. So counterfactual, as we mentioned earlier, is how can I take you from one class and turn you into something from another class it's at the very basic levels? So adversarial examples are actually a, 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 are an example of a counterfactual because I can take a picture with high, that has high confidence or even any amount of confidence and a correct prediction, add some noise to it, so change it, and then change it to a highly confident wrong class. Now, sensibly, one of the ways you can obtain adversarial examples for uncertainty uh, could be just by taking the gradient, doing a like gradient descent, right? Away from the original uncertainty estimate. So I have an image, let's say like this thing that looks like it probably is an eight on the left hand, on the bottom left. It has high uncertainty. I basically can do gradient descent away from it, I get a low uncertainty example, but now this thing is meaningless. That's not a real image. <laughs> so what we do is we take a book, a uh, page out of the drug data-driven drug discovery literature, where they usually restrict the hypothesis space to a manifold that'll capture the true generative model, <laughs> right? So you take a deep generative model, like a, a powerful VAE, and then you just do continuous optimization in latent space, as opposed to doing it in input space. So the molecules people, if you're familiar with any of those, that style of work, they've been doing this for quite a while. So we'll actually do the same thing. So instead of taking the doing gradient descent with respect to the uncertainty measure that you have, like variance or predicted or entropy, I might actually go to a deep generative model and then do gradient descent in the latent space there. And then I actually will obtain what you see on the bottom right. So it is something that looks more like an eight and has low uncertainty. So it takes my original input, does some latent space optimization and obtains a new input that has high uncertainty, uh, lower uncertainty as desired. So we call this clue where we ask, what is the smallest change you can make to the input to stay in distribution, which is our generative model, such that the model will produce a certain prediction. 
And then for if, if you had an image that looks like the six, it is an uncertain prediction, but look at our clue. Our clue is telling us the source of that uncertainty. It's actually that lip where that six is connected. Okay. So the way I'll just kind of gloss over the algorithm that we use to do this, but you first generate the counterfactual do uh, in, and then you basically will have some high dimensional input space where you, where you basically generated this counterfactual. You'll get a prediction from your, any Bayesian neural net or any kind of probabilistic model you have. And what we'll do is we'll, our loss function will consist of the uh, entropy metric, uh, the, the entropy measure. So the, the thing that you're using to calculate uncertainty and some distance between the original input and the, the embedding of the original input uh, and the new input that you're currently optimizing on. Right. And then you'll just kind of just do this iterative optimization. So now what would these clues look like? So you'll see uh, what we'll actually be able to do is create these saliency maps that tell you where uncertainty lies. Okay. So on the left-hand side, you have these zero looking things that say, well, actually, if you get rid of this little edge part on the right, the uh, uh, of this edge part of the zero, this little dangling thing, I'll actually be more certain. Right? If you make it a little bit thicker too. Or for this two, if you get rid of some of this, this other additional lip, like I can become more certain in this being a two. For the LSAT data set, you'll actually notice that um, you, you might be able to take, it might, might, you might be highly uncertain on this Asian female with a high GPA and high LSAT score. But if you were to change their race and their GPA ever so slightly, you'll become more certain. Okay, So these are uncertainty driven explanations, completely different types of explanations. Um, for the sake of time, I, I will just quickly describe our, our experiment. So one of the things we wanted to show is that these explanations can actually be useful to people, right? So if I were to show, what we do is we say, well, can we show a um, end user an uncertain point and a certain point, and then ask them if the new one is going to be certain or uncertain, right? That's basically the task. Can they simulate the certainty or uncertainty of the model? What we do is we first, uh, we, we basically, we have run a pilot study to basically select uncertain, to pair uncertain points and test points together. And then what we do is we have individual, we have different generating processes to create these certain points. Um, but I guess the thing that I just want to mention is that clue when provided to these end users was actually just more useful than providing sensitivity-based explanations or even human selected explanations or just random explanations, right? So clue explanations help data science practitioners better understand their model's uh, uncertainty landscape. And we've even done the same thing with images. So um, I guess all in all, I hope that I was able to communicate some amount of wariness with respect to the existing explainability literature that's become quite popular, motivated by real world applications and real world uh, stakeholder conversations. And then was able to talk a little bit more about the ideas associated with different forms of transparency that can become popular and helpful. Um, for example, uncertainty information. Um, so I, all in all, this was the talk title, uh, titled Challenges and Frontiers in Deploying Transparent Machine Learning. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email or, or reach out on Twitter. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions now. Thanks Uma, for this wonderful talk. So do we have questions from the audience? Uh, hi, Omang. Thank you for your talk. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could go back to your introduction and you were talking about how, for example, um, this, this button, why are you seeing this, the content of which is unregulated? Mm -hmm. you know? So what uh, is now the upshot based on your research? Um, what would be your recommendation in terms of how that content should look? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so it's it's unclear whether, so I don't think there's a technical solution to this problem. I do think that this is a, this is, this will be a disclosure, like privacy-based issue that will likely be even taken up in, in, in court. And the reason I mentioned this is there's no, 
accountability at the moment for an organization to communicate when they're using an AI system or not. Because right now we're just positing that they are. They likely are, but we don't know, right? For all we know, they're actually, there's someone manually, likely not true, but someone manually going there saying, okay, here's Umung's feed. We're going to quickly personalize it this way. Here's Jobs' feed. We're going to personalize it this way. So first of all, there's the, if we get that disclosure that there is an algorithmic system being used there, then we can actually have like privacy and advocacy communities, um, like some of the work that I was doing at Mozilla, basically come in and say, look, you need to be able to provide a useful explanation. And that definition of usefulness is kind of where computer scientists and some of us can come in and basically be like, well, is this actually a useful explanation that is faithful to the model that actually has some properties that are actually, um, that the end users might actually want. So the, the right, right now the issue is that there is no disclosure. So in, in doing so, we can basically get caught up in is this AI, is this not AI conversation, which basically occludes the actual thing, which is that I'm being served this ad, but I'm not being told why, but because they're not telling me how they're serving me this ad. And if they were using an AI system, I don't know if there are advocates in place who are going to be there to basically um, help me understand what I can even do with this information. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, and uh, a quick follow up that to that would be the, your your talk about uncertainty, the second half of it, where you know you identify different type, kinds of uncertainty, mm -hmm. and I wonder if there's any value in conveying that uncertainty um, in the form of a question. So you, you see sometimes Google ads, they say um, why are you seeing this, but then they follow up with a little menu of uh, questions. I no longer want it. Uh, I've already purchased the product and whatnot. Yeah. So I wonder if such a menu could be displayed that conveys uh, some of the types of uncertainty that uh, you were talking about in, of course, in a usable way. Definitely. And I wonder if that actually will increase trust or maybe undermine um, <laughs> the, rec yeah. the recommendation so, quality, perception of recommendation quality. This is this is such. There's 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 two interesting things that I want to follow up from that because that is an amazing point. So we have we actually have a paper under review right now where we've taken ad recommendations and we've shown people um, explanations of in a, in like a faithful form. We've shown them a certificate, so a certification of a, from a third party organization. Or we've shown them some sort of like disclosure saying that, well, your data is being used in a specific way, like trust us, basically. And it's been really interesting to see the findings. Surprisingly, no one, obviously, no one wants the explanation, which has kind of been the ethos of this talk today. <laughs> um, but a lot of people really like this certification, these third-party auditors, right? Maybe the the I'm using my data in the right way is it, it, it's a wording semantic thing, which I think there's really interesting questions to be asked there. Um, but this is reliance on a trusted third party. Now, maybe this is because we did it in Europe and it would work very differently in this country. <laughs> but but there's there's really interesting questions that I think we can ask. And coming back to that uncertainty point, I, I think that you're, you're spot on that there's definitely room to kind of solicit feedback from practitioners and non-technical stakeholders. So from, that practitioners can solicit non feedback from non-technical stakeholders. Now, my issue that I take up with a lot of this work is it's unclear how to use it. So this comes back to the, the point that was raised earlier. I have these saliency maps. I see that they're just bogus, but I don't know how to fix my model. And, 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 and it's unclear, like what, what, I can collect a bunch of information about what you don't like, but then I, do I go back and fine tune? Do I go back like, what is the technical fix? And, and my worry right now is that there are a lot of companies that are raising hundreds of millions of dollars claiming that they can do that backend. And where computer scientists are just standing here like, I don't think you can do that. Like, unless you're just retraining every time, which again, we love large compute-based problems and perhaps that's the best thing to do. But, but it's, it's, it's unclear what the best, what the best way prop forward is with respect to this interaction. So I'm really excited to see a bunch of people start to tackle this, this interaction problem of like, okay, I'm an end user. I've told you that I don't like this. What is, what as a practitioner are my recourse options? Well, is there some simple fine tuning procedure I can do? Is there some simple like loss function update? Like what is, what actually can I do with what you've told me? Right, right, yeah. And all, you know, or uh, disclosure, just what, what, what are you uncertain about? What is this model, you know, what is the, what does this model not know? Yeah. It doesn't know how to, could itself go a long way in building trust, I feel. Exactly, exactly, yeah.
Yeah, so yeah, I, I really like what you are saying about uh, all of this. And so, well, my uh, feeling about, well, uh, the problem in the explainable AI thing is that the evaluation part about, you know, explanation method, because there is a no ground truth label, right? You, you cannot come up with, so, so it's difficult to, you know, evaluate the faithfulness about your explanation method. So specifically, I, I, I'm trying to understand how you evaluate your, the, the uncertainty, uncertainty work. How do you evaluate the uncertainty, uh, whether it's, whether it is, is the right uncertainty or, or it is like overconfident or something? Yeah, no, this is, this is a really good question. So there's, how do you measure when you're well calibrated or not? So, so the, mm -hmm. the, the major thing in the uncertainty literature is that I want to be confident when I'm correct. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the ethos. And what's the, the major worry is that there might be cases where I'm overconfident and wrong. That is, that's deadly. Right, that is that could that could be disastrous. So, how do we prevent those? And there's there's some interesting measures, like I guess even like if you think way back, you can think about like expected calibration error or even like the Breyer score, like some of these interesting notions of like how do you make sure that when Y and Y hat are matched up, like I have particularly like calibrated predictions. Now, I think that there's there's still a lot of work to be done in making sure that. Um, the test time predictions are well calibrated, right? Because again, calibration is a post hoc procedure. It's done after you have a prediction. Um, so one of the things that I've been pretty excited about and we have a little bit of work on is, is conformal methods, which basically try to give you a guarantee saying, look, actually you're, you're, you've given me a thousand label problem, right? Thousand class problem. Given a thousand class problem, I'm probably going to be wrong and giving you a uniform distribution. Or I, I, it's going to be hard to be right. Maybe not hard to be wrong, but hard to be right, right? Um, uh, specifically, I might have uncertainty over like a few labels where a few labels um, together might actually lead to a confident prediction. So conformal prediction says, can you give me a set of labels such that with a user specified probability, let's say 90% probability, the true label lies in that set. So it's a post hoc procedure, just like calibration is. These are post hoc things that we can do to play around with our models to basically say, look, like I want to measure to see if this uncertainty is correct. Now, the good thing is in this, in this sense, we can actually just take the uncertainty measures that I was just discussing, like something conformal and basically show it to a human and be like, look, I can give you the top one prediction in this thousand class problem, but I might be wrong often, it might be 60% accurate, but I can give you a set of predictions, a set of labels where with 90% probability, I know it's in the true set and the average set size only three. That's amazing. I basically can dwindle it down to three and then give it to a decision maker and the decision maker can then make their decision, right? These are like ways to then say, okay, now, and the, the good thing is the user defined, pro it's a user defined probability, right? If they give me hundred percent, I can just give them 15,000 labels every time. I'm, that's not going to be useful, but I'll be with respect to our metrics, we're right. So I think there's lots of really interesting, clever ways, which are really going to be domain and like practitioner specific, which is why I keep bringing this, this idea up, which is that you, you really got to get down dirty to think about, well, where is the best place that I can plug in um, and, and kind of get my work, um, uh, my work out there. So um, yeah, I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, does anyone has questions to Uma? Well, if not, well, that's thanks, woman, for this wonderful talk. And virtually being Penn State, I'm not sure have ever been to Penn State as you 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 study in uh, Carnegie Mellon. I I did not. So I've driven past Penn State, uh, uh -huh. and the State College exit many times, but I haven't been. So hopefully, I can I make the trip out one day. Yeah, yeah. So welcome to virtually uh, visit Penn State, and yeah. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care.